Thank you. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you have heard us. You've heard our pleas. You've heard our prayers for relief from the fires in this state that has brought so much devastation, Lord. We know that you are master over the winds and the rains, and you have been faithful. You have sent relief. We look up at the beautiful blue sky and the good clean air. We breathe it in, and we can't help but be thankful, God, for your goodness and your grace that we can be here today together as a body of believers and hear your word and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for that wonderful privilege and opportunity that you have made a way. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to watch over those who are out there putting their life on the line every day to bring containment and resolution to these fires. That you would just cover them, Lord, with your hedge of protection. You would give them victory, Lord, by your mighty hand. And Lord, you would continue to heal the state of Oregon. All that it's broken, Lord, we give it to you. But we also join in with your work. Help us to see what to do, Lord God. We pray for our nation. We pray you bring healing to our nation because we need so much healing. And the world, Lord, we pray again that you continue to bring resolution to this COVID-19 pandemic, which has really changed our world. Thank you, Lord. We know that you are faithful. We sung that today. We praised you because of it. But let us, Lord, not only say it with our mouth, but believe it in our heart. Always stay faithful to your promises. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Good to be up here on the back of my truck. This is my truck. So, you know, I can stand on it and bounce on it and do whatever. It's kind of fun. But uh, it's great to be able to bring you God's word this morning. We're going to continue our series in finding your place on the wall. We're going through Nehemiah. And uh, what does it mean? Let's just start right off with what does it mean to find your place on the wall? I think it's good that we make sure you understand this every week and know what you signed up for because many of you have signed up to find your place on the wall, to put your name on the wall online. And we appreciate that. And some of you are still wondering what does that mean and maybe you're hesitant to join in. Well, let me tell you what it means to find your place on the wall. So we have decided, when you want to find your place on the wall, you have decided, we have decided to let God break our hearts for what breaks His, for what is broken. First in ourselves, right? We got to get honest with ourselves. Then second, we look outward to the world. What's broken out there? in our life, in our community, in the U.S., and all over the world, really. So we want God to break our heart. And then last week we talked about praying big, going to God and asking for direction and favor. And then praying big when we engage people who really kind of are our access point to making a change sometimes. Like the king in Nehemiah, Pastor Brad talked about that. And then together, we make the decision to join together as a body of believers, right? Arms linked together to form a mighty wall of believers. And if we hold together, nothing can stop us. That's what it means to find our place on the wall. So we have decided, folks, to begin a good work. You've said you're ready, and today I hope you're ready. But there's something I want you to to realize today. I want you to consider that when we begin a good work, we can expect opposition. Those who would criticize us, those who would complain, do whatever they can to derail us from completing the good work that God has called us into. And I think we need to put 
some perspective into the critics that come into our life. I love what Theodore Roosevelt said, and I know many of you have heard this quote before you've read it, but he said this, it's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or when the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, man or woman, whose face is marred by the dust and sweat and blood. Now, there's more to that quote, so I, I encourage you to look it up, okay? Let's talk about that for a second. First, let's admit that it's hard sometimes to just step into that arena, right, to take that leap of faith. We have to trust God to do that. But once we're all in, once we step into that arena, we need to know how to deal with the opposition that comes our way. If we deal with it the right way, we will certainly grow as a result. So as we step into the arena to do good work, there's three action items that I believe we can take to deal with the cynics, the critics, and the complainers that will come along in our life. So let's look at Nehemiah together, starting in chapter 2, verse 18. Nehemiah has inspected the damage of the wall. So he knows what's up. And in his mind, he's got a plan. And he invites the people to join in. He's starting to divvy out the work, which is awesome. And everyone said, let us start building. So we are all in. So they began a good work. But when Sanballat the Hornite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? <coughs> right out of the gate, Nehemiah, before he even really got started, he faced opposition. Do you know how that feels? You've ever experienced that? You started a good work and somebody came up and you said, Are you serious? You can't hope to expect to change anything in your life. You can't hope to make a difference in somebody else's life <coughs> or the world. Really? But anytime we decide to start a good work, and when I say good work, what I mean is work that produces fruit in your life, good things in your life where you're getting healthy, where you're getting better, or you're helping someone else do the same, or you see a need in the world, and you take action, and that brings things to a better place. That is fruit. That is a good work. But any time you start a good work, there'll be opposition, because Satan sniffs out what you're trying to do, and he wants to snuff it out. He sniffs it out, and he wants to snuff it out. John 10.10 the thief, that's Satan. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy any good work that you start. And how will he do it? He often uses other people in our life, people who are close to us, to do it. <coughs> I got a little itch. I don't know if there's any water down there, but he'll, he'll use people. He'll use friends. He'll use family, mom, dad, sister, brother. I know it sucks, right? You're thinking, no, I don't like that. I don't either. Sister, brother, son, daughter, to come against you, to stop you from doing that good work. Thank you, sir. So how do we safeguard the good work that God has called us into. Well, that's our first action. Write this down. We need to armor up daily. What does that mean? Well, check out what Nehemiah said. 
to the people who are opposing him. In 2.20, he says this, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or any historic right to it. I love, the God of heaven will give us success. Nehemiah is confident that God will give him success. Why is he so confident? Why could he say that? Well, you have to, if you don't know the story, before Nehemiah ever got started, he heard about the wall. He fell to his knees and he got into prayer. He got in communion with God. He confessed. He opened up his heart to God. He asked for direction. He asked for wisdom. And this gave him strength and confidence for the journey because he was tethered to God. He put on the armor of God. He knew that there's no way he could start this good work and there was no way he could finish it without putting on the armor of God. And the Bible tells us this is something that we need to do. In Ephesians 6.10, a final word, word, Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? When we start a good work. How do we put on the armor of God? What are some simple but effective Ways to put on the armor of God. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> How do we do that? Daily quiet time with the Lord, folks. This is a, a must every day. We've got to make this a habit in our life. We carve out time. We carve out a place. Just you and God. No distractions, folks. We, we get into prayer. That's the first thing that we should do. However God is leading you into prayer. Some people get on their knees. Some people stand with their arms raised. Whatever you feel is right. And you, you bear your heart to the Lord. Listen. Sweet time. One-on-one -on -one with God. And then I would get into scripture. When your heart's prepared through prayer, even, hey, sh throw up a, a, some worship before you even get into the word. That's cleansing. Have a reading plan. Have a good reading plan so you're not fumbling around each day wondering, what am I going to read today? A reading plan will take care of that. Go to your reading plan. Meditate, ruminate, chew on it. Get your journal out. We like to do the soap method here. We write down a scripture. We observe what it's saying. We apply it to our life. That's so important. And then we ask God to help us through prayer. But if you have your own way that works for you, go for it. Seek God's direction and wisdom each day. That's how we build the armor of God into our life. And God's armor gives us strength, confidence, and wisdom to stay in the battle. Strength to stand up to the opposition. Hold your ground. Confidence in the work that you are doing knowing that God has called you to this good work. You won't second guess your yourself Turn tail and run. Wisdom to respond appropriately to those who are coming against you, to those who oppose you. Nehemiah had strength, confidence, and wisdom to deal with his opposition. God has helped me in this area. I have had all sorts of people come against me in my time in ministry and in in, really in life. 
and God helps me to deal with it. The one thing that he has taught me is that I always have to kind of go into prayer. When someone comes against me, if someone brings something against me, what's their motive? Why are they doing this? What are they trying to accomplish, right? Maybe they're critiquing me because they don't understand what I'm doing. I haven't explained myself well enough. They can't get on board because they're lacking some information. That's okay. That's when I want to fill in the blanks, and I appreciate that. We can work with people like that, but if they're just there to complain about everything, no matter what you do, if they're just cynics, only believing that everything you do is for your own good and glory, then you're not going to be able to change anything. And that's when I've learned to put some distance, put some boundaries up between those people. You know, you've got to set boundaries. Sometimes it's hard to set boundaries with our own family. We've, you've had family come against you. I have. What do I do? I love them so much, but am I just supposed to kick them out of my life? If they're like constantly complaining and criticizing, and that's a hard thing to do, right? I don't necessarily kick them out of my life, but I certainly put up healthy boundaries. I say, look, you cannot bring that up around me. You cannot bring that up around my family. Please don't go there, and I won't go there. Boundaries. We set boundaries, and we pray for those people, right? We don't condemn them. We pray for them because, look, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against the unseen spiritual forces in this world, Ephesians 6, 12, right? So we don't condemn those that come against us. We pray for them. And I'll tell you what, when I've set boundaries, when I've kind of put some distance, people have come to their senses. They've realized that, you know what, I was wrong. So when we do that, it actually can be for their own good. Don't forget that. Don't be afraid to put up boundaries. The armor of God, folks, to put on the armor of God is to stand with God. But not only that, we also must stand with others. Look what it says in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to their work. Obviously, the people were walking around in fear. They're a little tired, a little worn out. They needed someone to help lift them up, to protect them, to carry the load, to have each other's back, to support one another, to pray with each other. That's what we need to do. That's our second action. We need to stand together. Stand together. If we're going to deal with the opposition, we need to stand together. So Nehemiah, he's, he's a genius. He knows this. So check out what he does, right? <laughs> Verse 13. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families, with their swords and spears and bows. Verse 17, those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. Lastly, verse 23, this is key. Neither I or my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. This is a great picture of families standing together, back to back, ready to defend each other in case of an attack. They were a united front. They never let their guard down for each other. I don't know if you've been reading the news, I have, but you may have read about the two sheriffs who got ambushed in the city of Compton, down in the L.A. area. Yeah, they were sitting in their car, 
some random person came up and shot them at them just through the window. Two sheriffs caught the gal in the jaw, I think some other places, caught the other guy in the forehead, and in the arm, and I think in the leg. But just like, can you imagine? How do you survive that? Out of nowhere, the attack came. <laughs> Look at what the female deputy did. She helped the other wounded deputy, got on the radio, provided medical care, got him to a place of safety because they didn't know if there was another attack coming their way. I wonder if they would have survived if they hadn't been taking care of each other, if they weren't standing back to back, if they didn't have each other's back. She, I think she saved his life. They're actually in satisfactory condition now, which is absolutely amazing. The same way, we need to stand together, back to back. We do that through epic groups. What is an epic group? They're groups that meet weekly, where we as a body of believers come together, we meet together in a home, we break bread together, we read scripture together, we grow together, we pray for each other, we have each other's backs, we do life together, we stand back to back. If you're not in an epic group, please get in one today. You can sign up, epichouse.church. Just go to our website, download the app. The app is awesome. You can join a group right from the app. You can see all the groups that are going right now. It's open enrollment right now. Get in an epic group. Every person in community is what? That's our heart. That's what we want. We don't want you to walk alone. And students, talking to you, we have four epic groups going on. We call them alpha groups for middle school boys, middle school girls, high school boys, high school girls. They're going to be awesome. We're on the website. Parents, please sign up your student to get into these alpha groups because they need to be in community too. It's so important that they're in community. Who's got your back? Who's got your back? Together, we start a good work, and together, right, we must see it through. In order to do that, we have to stay focused. Great progress can sometimes trick us into letting our guard down, right? Has this happened to you? Look what's going on here in Nehemiah 6.2. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. So he's, he's doing the work. I think the, the, the wall has been repaired, but the gates still need to be completed. So he's, the work has been awesome. They have been just killing it, taking care of business. They're feeling good about themselves, keeping the opposition at bay. So this is what these guys decide to do. Come let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them, and this was his reply. This is what Nehemiah replied. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times <laughs> they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. That kind of makes me chuckle. It's like, Come on, guys, get the hint, right? Four times. It reminds me of my son, Alex. Daddy, can I have this? No. 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 Finally, he gets the message, right? After four times, it's like, what? They're kind of being like a stubborn kid trying to get Nehemiah to meet with them. <laughs> it's so funny. He was staying focused 
to the plan that God had for him. And that's our final action. We need to keep focused on the plan. If we're going to deal with the opposition, we need to stay focused on the plan. Now, these guys are like, look, if we can't scare him to stop, let's kind of bamboozle him. Let's sweet talk him into meeting. And then, then we'll get him, right? Like these guys, they're, they're thinking, they're pulling out all the stops. Nehemiah refused to let his guard down. He refused to let the opposition in. And we can sometimes get tricked by like sweet words, great gestures, false sense of reconciliation. People can sweet talk us into this to meeting and then they just want to like hijack us. It's happened to me. There was a time, there was a season in my life where some people were coming against me in the church. Breaks my heart, but in the church. And you know what's funny? I think about that time and I think about kind of standing my ground. And I don't know if there was ever a time where I wasn't like just worshiping more deeply, more on fire, more focused on the work that needed to be done, on the mission that God had me on, on the good work that he had called me into, more so than when people were coming against me. There was just like this holy fire in me that just would not let it in. And I was on fire, man. It, it, was, it was great. And things were happening. I don't think they liked it. So one day they decided, I think, kind of like these guys, hey, let's sweet talk Jay into just sitting down and talking about it. And then we'll, we'll get him. And I did. I let him in and we talked. And all of a sudden it was all about everything I was doing wrong, what they didn't like. They weren't there to reconcile. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And praise the Lord, Pastor Brad got wind of it. And he's like, dude, you, you can't do this anymore. You got to stop you got to remember the good work that God has called you to, Jason. Get back to work. It's like, wow, thanks, Pastor Brad. <laughs> I'm so glad that Pastor Brad had my back there. In order to stay focused on our good work, we have to be continually reminded that God knows his plan for us, and it is good. Jeremiah 29, 11. You've heard this, I'm sure, many times. This is an often quoted verse. This is a lot of people's life verse. And I think it should be. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. If we put this verse into context, this verse was spoken by Jeremiah over the exiles. They were exiled into Babylon, right? They were there. They were captives. And they were wondering, Lord, is there any, like, are we going to be restored? Is there, is there any silver lining to this? And they were getting discouraged, and people were, were speaking falsely in their life. And God said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes, you are captive for a time, but I promise you that I know the plan for you. And ultimately, it's for good. I'm going to restore you into back to your home. And what did he do? He did. They were already in Jerusalem. The city was being rebuilt. The walls are being rebuilt. Nehemiah remembered this. He knew that God knew what he was doing, and he just needed to stay with the plan, stay faithful, stay on course. You know, it's funny, is that same year, there was a lot of craziness going on in the church. People were coming against me, they were coming against Pastor Brad, more so Pastor Brad. And it could have easily, I think, derailed God's mission for us, because when, when you've got people coming at you, it wears you down. And oftentimes, you're just like crying for help, you're not sure what to do. It, it can really uh, set you back can really derail you. And that year, we were going on a mission trip to, to Uganda. And Pastor Brad confided in me. He's like, look, I, don't even, I didn't even know if I wanted to go because of all this stuff that was happening. But God's like, remember the plans I have for you, Pastor Brad. I have called you to Uganda. I've called you to Ishaka to plant a church. It is good. 
go. So we went. We got there. All, and the church wasn't even being built. It was supposed to be built by the time we got there. But the government had slowed the plans. We weren't even sure if that church was going to get built. We could have despaired. We could have said, well, well, let's just change our plans, right? But no, remember, I know the plans I have for you. That church will be built. And guess what? It was built. And it has changed that community from top to bottom. There is a university there, Kampala University. I think it was predominantly Muslim, okay? And, and so Ishaka came in, and they started evangelizing that place. And students were coming to Christ because of the good work that God was doing. There was one Muslim uh, dude there that heard the gospel. He gave his life to Christ, and now he runs the student ministry on the campus. I think he wants to be a pastor. I've met him. He's amazing. Now think about that. If we would have let all that chaos and opposition come against us, what we would have missed out on. Ugh. Not good. We have to remember that God knows what he's doing in your life. He knows what he's doing in your life. He knows what he's doing at Epic House. He knows what he's doing in the state of Oregon. He knows what he's doing in our country, in the whole world. He has a plan. It always works for good. We should not despair. We need to trust in God and stay focused on the plan. His plan is always good, even when it doesn't feel good in the moment. Now, it's true when God calls us to start a good work, it takes a lot of energy, right? It takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of blood and sweat and time to get it done. It's not easy work, but it's good work. And when we start a good work, opposition will want to suck all of our energy away from the good work and redirect it so the good work stops. Each time opposition comes your way, I want you to be able to say, leave me alone, I'm doing a good work for God. Leave me alone, I'm doing the good work for God. But if you're going to be able to say that, then you need to armor up daily. You need to stand together with other believers back to back and you need to stay focused on the plan that God has for you that he's called you into where are you today what has God put on your heart if he's called you if you placed yourself on the wall what is it that he's now asking you to do next maybe you are experiencing some opposition how are you going to deal with that now? What are you going to do differently now that we've learned from what Nehemiah has done? Maybe you've not yet put your name on the wall, but now you know you're feeling the tugging on your heart like God's calling me into a good work. I can't turn my back on it anymore. It's time. I'm not afraid of the opposition. I'm ready to stand my ground. Worship team, you can come on up. Whatever it is, I want you to take that next step on your connection card. You can write it in, go online, put it in. Be faithful to what God's calling you to do. And let's go to him in prayer and ask for help because we need his help to do what he's called us to do. Pray with me. Father God in heaven, you are so good and we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that you don't leave us or forsake us, that we can lean into your power, your wisdom, your strength, that we don't have to do it on our own, that we can stand firm when opposition comes because you give us the words to say, you give us the discernment, you help us to take action, you bring people in our life that, ha that can have our backs. So we thank you for that, Lord. Help us to be faithful in the good work that you called us to do. What's next, Lord? What would you have of us? 
Help us to see the next step so we can take it faithfully and trust you all the way. It's your victory, not ours. Your glory, not ours. Thank you so much, God, for your goodness and your grace. I pray for each heart here that you would strengthen them, encourage them, build into them, bless them, protect them, guide them, Lord. Give them your favor. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Epic House, thank you so much for joining us this week online. If you're new here, I just wanna welcome you and encourage you to fill out a connection card. That's either, if you're on YouTube, the link in the description below. It's also available on our app or online. And whether you're new or a family member, please don't neglect to fill that out. That's gonna be our best way for us to be able to connect with you, to be able to know what's going on in your life. If you, a family member, a coworker, somebody you know uh, is struggling right now from these wildfires, uh, and is maybe in need of shelter, food, finances, please do not neglect to reach out to us. If you need prayer, uh, if you need um, assistance, if you need counsel, please fill out a connection card, send that in and let us know what way we can help. Because of our incredible congregation, because of your guys' faithful tithing and giving, we're able and prepared to be able to act immediately uh, when we hear something or, or hear a way we can meet a need. Um, and I just wanna thank you so much. Right now, I do wanna remind you, we have a wildfire fund right now uh, in our giving location online or in the app. That's epichouse.church forward slash give. Uh, there you're gonna choose a tab, right at the tab for tithe, for give, or offering. Uh, there's gonna be the wildfire tab, just click on that. And I wanna ask you to pray, pray for Oregon, pray with us as to can't, what has God put on your heart to give financially towards this? Or maybe give resources you might have. Maybe give a bedroom, a, a place in your house that, you, that might be available for shelter. Uh, give your own two hands, your time, to maybe go help people evacuate or go bring supplies uh, to the first responders out there. Please just pray with us in this, in this really difficult time. And lastly, I do just wanna encourage you and remind you that we have our brand new Epic House app now available in your app store. You just go to your app store, search Epic House and download that. That's gonna be an incredible way for you to be able to stay connected, to be able to know what's going on, especially in this season where everything is so fluid, uh, but also for you to be able to, if, if you're a family, uh, we're gonna have a specific spot, easy to find spot for kids and, and for your children to be able to listen and watch sermons tailored to them, messages tailored to them during Sundays throughout the week and just a way for them to stay connected to the church and to continue to grow. Also, we're continuing our pledge of placing your name on the wall. And what that means is you are agreeing to the purpose and the meaning that God has placed on your life, the plan that he's placed on your life, and that you are saying, I'm going to reach that and meet that and agree with that. And if that's you, I just wanna encourage you, through the app or online, you can find the wall and place your name on the wall and sign up. Our goal is to get a thousand names by the end of this sermon series, and we are believing hard for it. Lastly, I just wanna thank all of you so much uh, for your flexibility, uh, for, for us being able to be so fluid, and how you guys have just rallied around, not just COVID-19, but this transition into Epic House, and, and really rallied around already in this last week for wildfires. Thank you so much. God bless you, and pray for Oregon.